We are, thank you all for joining us today for this uh, special edition um, of the Europe Imaging Virtual Pub, where we'll be learning about the quest to find new therapy options for acute myeloid leukemia, which is a very aggressive blood cancer. Part of this research project um, that we'll be hearing about today was carried out under the Corbell project and involved work at both EU OpenScreen and Eurobioimaging, which is why we have a bit of an extended audience here today. First, we'll hear from the two researchers involved in this project, Professor Macelli and Roberto Ranieri. And after that, we'll get a brief overview from the two research infrastructures, the Open Screen and Eurobioimaging, that were involved in this project about their service offer and how they support cross RI projects. But before we get started with the presentations, I just want to um, ask everyone who is maybe joining us today for the first time for the virtual pub, if you would like to be on our mailing list so that you can find out about uh, future meetings and the topics that will be pre presented there, please put your email into the Zoom chat and we'll add you to the mailing list or you can also send it directly to me via the Zoom chat. Additionally, we'll be recording today's um, virtual pub meeting. So if you would like to not be visible in the recording, please turn off your video. Okay, and with that, I think we can get started. Um, we'll begin with a presentation from uh, Professor, Professor Mar Marcelli. Uh, Professor Marcelli is Associate Professor in Hematology at the University of Perugia and Assistant Clinical Director at the Perugia General Hospital. Her clinical and research work is dedicated to the care and treatment of patients with malignant hematological diseases. And today she'll tell us about her lab's work on acute myeloid leukemia. Thank you, Professor Marcelli, for joining us. Thank you. So, um, really thanks for uh, the, the invitation and uh, for the introduction. Uh, let me thank uh, particularly MBL and Corbel uh, for uh, MBL for this and bio imaging for this meeting and uh, all the participants. Uh, as Joanna introduced, I'm a clinician, a hematologist, and a researcher also at the Hematology Institute in Perugia University in Italy, and I've been studying and following patients with acute myeloid leukemia for the past uh, uh, 25 years or more. Today, I, I will introduce um, our project um, aimed to find, to detect a new therapy option for acute myeloid uh, leukemia. Um, Okay. Acute myeloid leukemia is an aggressive hematological malignancy that originates in the hematopoietic progenitors and has an estimated incidence of a steeper 100,000 individuals, uh, resulting in 15,000 newly diagnosed patients each year in Europe. ML affects all ages, but most commonly the elderly population with an age that has reached 70 years. Um, all about 40% of adult young patients can be cured. Outcome in many patients, particularly in older patients, is still dismal. Uh, prognosis can be very different based on karyotype with this survival curve in younger. Here, uh, the group uh, with the intermediate prognosis uh, includes uh, uh, mainly disease uh, with uh, no cytogenetic alterations that remained mostly uncharacterized for years. Then in 2005, uh, a study led by Professor Brunangelo Falini, my mentor and head here at our institute, reported mutations in uh, uh, M-nucleophotamine gene and PM1 gene leading to cytoplasmic NPM1 in the leukemic cells, as characterizing about 60% of ML with a normal karyotype, making NPM1 gene mutations the most frequent genetic lesion in ML. Three years later, in 2008, the publication of the entire genomic sequence of the first human cancer sample that was indeed a case of ML with a normal karyotype with NPM1 gene mutation. The application of this method to an increasingly larger number of cases has led to the definition of the mutational landscape in ML with the publication 
in 2000, uh, 2013 by the Cancer Genome Atlas Group of the results of the analysis of 200 AML cases uh, and the identification of 23 recurrently mutated genes in ML. We therefore arrive at the a greater heterogeneity in ML and increasingly complex reality for acute myeloid leukemia, with the genetic lesions uh, defining the specific molecular classes and their concurrent uh, uh, gene mutations. You may notice uh, that uh, the largest lies uh, in this pie chart is represented by MPN1 mutation, accounting for about one third of all cases. So this is uh, the ML molecular landscape today. But uh, what about the therapy? Despite the great heterogeneity, with a few exceptions, standard therapy that includes cycles of intensive chemotherapy is the backbone of treatment common to all ML. Besides the standard in intensive chemotherapy, in the past three years, uh, new targeted drugs have been approved for ML treatment and are now in clinical use. However, still the majority of the genetic lesions are undruggable. And these include, as you may see, and PM1, which as already mentioned, is the most frequent ML. Uh, this leukemia uh, has been discovered by our group, by Professor Palini, by, uh, by immunohistochemistry on bone marrow biopsies of patients, which revealed in about one third of cases an aberrant cytoplasmic positivity for MPM1 instead of the normal, the, the nuclear uh, staining factor typical of all the other cells. In fact, MPM1 white type, which is a protein essential for life, in a physiological condition uh, is mainly found in the nucleolus, but makes the shuttling between the nucleolus and the cytoplasm as chaperon for a variety of molecules and is involved in ribosome biogenesis and many other important uh, functions. Notably, MPN1 mutations with cytoplasmic positivity are uniquely found in ML, and this makes uh, MPN1 mutant protein an ideal target for therapy. However, uh, as I said, NPM1 is not an obviously a directly druggable protein. The localization of NPM1 um, and its chaperone properties are due to specific uh, protein domains, either nuclear localization uh, or export domains, with the C-terminal domain involved in binding to the nucleolus. The export in the cytoplasm is mediated by CRM1 or exporting 1. At the base of uh, the aberrant cytoplasmic localization of MPM1 in leukemia, there is a series of uh, gene mutations that almost all involve exon uh, with the consequent uh, formation of a mutated protein um, modified at the level of the last amino acid, where there is uh, um, one, the loss of one or both the tryptophans at position 280 and 290, important, as I said, for the binding to the nucleolus. And two, the acquisition of a new nuclear export signal, must be indicated here in green. In summary, uh, there are these two major changes as a consequence of the mutations on the protein to ensure its cytoplasmic localization. The essentiality of the mutant MPM1 and its cytoplasmic localization in the maintenance of a leukemia has been elegantly demonstrated by Lorenzo Brunetti, a colleague of us at our institute, applying CRISPR technology to either add the uh, terminal nuclear export signal domain of MPM1 mutant with the, its subsequent nucleolar, uh, uh, nuclear relocalization or in, induce its degradation. Upon this modification, cells undergo uh, differentiation and cell growth uh, are rest effect, uh, anti leukemic effect. But uh, going back uh, to uh, therapy, 
um, and the concept of a target therapy. The goal of a target therapy is to have more effective drugs against a specific disease, but also drugs which um, selectively kill disease cells sparing normal cells with a consequent uh, reduction in related toxicity, and so drugs with uh, the so-called good therapeutic index. An ideal anti-cancer drug should hit uh, target essential for uh, the viability of the tumor cells only, uh, ideally. There, these can be either targets that are not present in the normal cell, uh, like, uh, for example, mcm one mutant uh, uh, protein E, or targets uh, which are in common, uh, but in which, however, the tumor cells uh, need differently from normal. Therefore, uh, contextual differences could be exploited um, to hit more specifically cancer than normal cells. Thus, cancer cells has on one side an oncogene addiction, which is obvious and on the other side, also possible other dependencies. Therefore, starting from the concept that the main functional consequence of the gene mutation is the production of a mutant protein residing in the cytoplasm, it was reasonable to think that this new condition might alter many equilibria inside the cell, leukemic cells and establish a new complex network of possibly unique pathways responsible for leukemia, which remains still unknown. The idea um, of our project is to focus, besides the MPM1 mutated MPM1, on the specific X factor or factors making the difference on which leukemic cells may rely. And the goal of our project is to identify and target this key player. To this aim, on one side, genetic knockout, gene, uh, knockout screening can be exploited uh, to assess the essentiality of individual genes within distinct genetic entities or subgroups and uh, define uh, um, for this a sort of map of specific dependencies and vulnerability uh, to be attacked. But on the other hand, the screening of drugs with different readouts could uh, also serve as a tool to identify essential pathways for the leukemic cells and perhaps realize that some of these drugs are capable of inducing inhibition or better degradation of the fundamental oncoprotein. So with the idea that there is something unique for rather in MPM1 mutated ML, we designed a strategy based on two complementary approaches and have been awarded uh, with an ERP consolidator grant in 2016-17. The hypothesis-driven approach uh, is mainly aimed to rethink the known in the of the genetic vision. This requires a deep knowledge of the disease and stems from our uh, previous uh, studies. However, upon going much farther, we are using a wide screening based approach with the cutting edge technologies aimed to the unknown. This is certainly required by the complexity of MPM1 as a multitasking protein. The Corbel project is a further development of work package to of our ERC project that includes, on one side, uh, a chemical library high to put screening on cell lines with or without MPM1 gene mutation to find drugs or compounds synthetically lethal with MPM1 mutation and thus specifically active against MPM1 mutated ML. And on the other side, high to put screening on a fit for purpose cell models expressed in fluorescently labeled mutated MPM1 to find drugs or compounds able to induce uh, either relocalization of the mutated protein from the cytoplasm into the nucleoplasm or its degradation. I will let Roberta talk on her work and experience uh, as uh, the two research infrastructures uh, chosen within uh, this uh, uh, Corbett project. And um, let me at the end uh, uh, thank um, all my team that is uh, becoming every day bigger 
but most importantly, more involving and passionate about uh, translational research on ML. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, all uh, the attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, exciting event, so, of course. Uh, so um, today I would like to, pre to show you some data obtained from the uh, COBE project that we have uh, performed uh, uh, with uh, the collaboration of two research infrastructure. As already mentioned by Professor Martelli, our research uh, interest is mainly focused on the NPM1 mutated AML, and I specifically worked on the, the drug screening. So thanks to the Corbel, um, the Corbel grant, we had the opportunity to collaborate with the two research infrastructure um, uh, within uh, the EU Open Screen and the Euro Bio Imaging Network and scale up our uh, drug screening approach. So Corbel is um, uh, an initiative of, of uh, 13 uh, new biological and medical uh, research infrastructure in uh, Europe, which uh, together create a platform uh, which, uh, th that allow user access to their uh, facility, uh, technologies, and also expertise. So for uh, our Corber uh, project, we decide uh, to uh, collaborate with uh, the uh, FMP, Leibniz FMP Institute in Berlin well, in order to perform a nitroput screening of a drug, um, a large collection of drugs and compounds that were available at their uh, screening platform. And uh, as a secondary research infrastructure, we have chosen to collaborate with the microscopy facility uh, at uh, EMBL in Heidelberg to take advantage of their uh, cutting edge uh, um, equipment and uh, scientist expertise. So, uh, this comes to uh, our uh, aims, uh, research aims. Uh, so, in, the, uh, in particular, as regards the first part of our uh, uh, screening was related to the drug screening, focusing on compounds that were able to kill se in selectively uh, the, um, the NPM1 mutated cells in comparison with uh, the wild type ones, uh, with the ultimate goal of unveiling a new type targets and novel therapeutic options. Um, as regards the second aim, it was closely related to the first one because we decided to test the screening compound actively um, selected from the screening performed in um, Berlin. And uh, in this case, uh, our aim was to directly eating the uh, mutant protein and study the phenotypic uh, change of the mutant protein in terms of uh, relocalization or degradation uh, using a microscopy. So uh, here, a, a summary of our uh, Corbel past uh, over the time, where the main stages are indicated. Uh, starting from the notification of the, the Corbel grant, uh, our uh, project um, has uh, gradually uh, uh, progressed into different uh, steps um, that were uh, uh, preceded by setting up experiments and uh, validation of the experiments both in-house and each research infrastructure. Uh, in addition, a preliminary visit to each research infrastructure gives us also the um, uh, possibility to optimize all experimental conditions before the final screen. So, um, a delay that was uh, not foreseeable uh, before was due to the corona emergency, but uh, that uh, slightly slowed down our project without, however, interrupting it. Uh, so, um, uh, comes to the first aim um, for what concerns the first aim of uh, our uh, uh, Corbett project, it um, concerned the uh, uh, high throughput screening of drugs and compounds in order to find. Uh, compounds with the side, the side right biological effects in a drug collection. 
So um, a large collection of compounds that were available at the screening platform in Berlin. Um, and so in this case, our um, approach and the ESA methods were configured to have sufficient throughput and low cost. Uh, and um, essentially, it was based on three main phases, which uh, were the uh, plate generation, the drug treatment, and the cell viability say. Uh, and uh, uh, here a scheme of our strategy that was a, a two-step strategy where in the first step we analyzed the entire collection against the, the MPM1 mutated AML and after the analysis of the results we decide to test uh, the uh, molecules um, selectively able to kill uh, the, the MPM1 mutating cells uh, again uh, um, uh, with, uh, in comparison with the, the MPM1 wild-type AML cells. In this case, we also uh, try to, um, uh, to um, understand the, the molecules, uh, the, the selectivity activity of the molecules selected. So we introduced also lower concentration of the of compounds. Uh, just to give you an idea of the numbers of our screening, we started from 40 thousand compounds that were tested uh, here with uh, the resazurin based uh, cell viability say and uh, from the analysis of the it compound we uh, obtained sorry we obtained 700 compounds that were uh, uh, were analyzed for their uh, ability to kill in selective way the MPM1 mutated cells. So we uh, obtained 62 compounds that were further reduced to 37 compounds after the validation steps that we um, um, performed in our lab. Uh, so we ended up with two compounds that uh, show with the markedly um, uh, activity against the MPM1 mutated cells. These compounds are now being uh, validated on uh, in vivo research and at the same time on the primary cells derived from uh, patients. Uh, here, um, just an overview on, of uh, all types of experiments that we performed in our lab uh, to better uh, characterize the molecules that we obtain during the screening uh, uh, or the screening uh, uh, experiments. Uh, the dotted line indicated the, the, here um, uh, are the current three studies going on at the moment. So uh, in um, uh, so uh, our uh, um, the, the strategy that we proposed here and um, in particular so the results obtained um, so far indicate that by looking at specific vulnerabilities in MPM1 mutated AML, uh, we hope to find the new potential drug drugs that can be useful uh, for the clinical trial design and, of course, the benefit of patients. Uh, as regards the second part of our Corbel, uh, Corbel project, we decide to um, uh, collaborate with the microscopy facility at the EMBL uh, to screen the selected uh, molecules uh, derived from the screening uh, um, uh, performed at, um, in Berlin to um, uh, test them uh, using microscopy. In this case, our aim was to check uh, the, the, their activity on uh, the mutant protein, so their ability to, to hit the mutant protein both in terms of relocalization or degradation. Uh, so uh, thanks to the support of and the expertise, of course, of the scientists involved, we designed um, well uh, um, the, we designed a pipeline that fits what, with our purpose 
and um, the, that uh, could allow us to uh, start from the image acquisition and uh, try to um, uh, obtain as many as information as possible from the analysis of the acquired, uh, acquired image. Uh, here, an example of a potential uh, promising uh, molecules that it is able uh, um, to um, relocalize our protein of interest. Uh, for this purpose, in addition for this purpose, what we did is also to create and provide um, to provide a, a specific cell model expressing uh, adherent cell model um, expressing fluorescent uh, NPM1 mutant protein uh, to um, uh, that allow us to check the um, the, the MPM1 mutated protein in terms of relocalization or degradation. So it means the, uh, the levels of a protein inside the cells. Uh, in the middle, uh, here a picture, a clear picture of a drugs, a control drugs that works uh, uh, inducing the relocalization of MPM1 mutant protein from the barren cytoplasmic uh, uh, compartment to the nucleus. Uh, so, starting from the 700 compounds screened uh, in this phase, we obtain a promising uh, uh, one compounds that now are uh, be be being validated in our lab. Uh, so, uh, of course, this uh, promising uh, results uh, prompt us to continue uh, to go on with the collaboration with the MBL facility, and thanks also to a three, three years fellowship that the Italian Association for Cancer Research gave me, of course, could be another um, opportunity to going on with the, our collaboration. So, in conclusion, the, the proposed strategy and uh, the integration of results uh, um, obtained from each research infrastructure um, are expected to give us the unique opportunity to develop and tailor a target therapy that uh, um, could be useful for the benefit of a patient in a reasonably short time. And that is very important in our research. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, of course, our um, um, our um, the experience with Corbel was very, very positive, allowing us to uh, improve both our research, but also our experience uh, in field where we were not familiar with. So to finish, I, I would like to thank uh, our research group coordinated by Professor Martelli, and of course, our collaborator in Berlin and uh, in Heidelberg. And specifically um, Carola, uh, Sabi Sabrina and Martin from uh, FMP, in, um, uh, FMP Institute in Berlin and Faba and Tishi uh, at uh, EMBL in Heidelberg. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, of course I am here uh, to answer to your question. Thank you for this really interesting talk, Roberta. This was it's, uh, very fascinating hearing about this, um, how you can put the screening um, to, to very important use. Are there any questions for um, Professor Martelli or for Roberta? Maybe um, while people think of some questions, you can also put them in the chat or you can um, either directly ask them. Maybe I can then get started um, with a question. Um, Roberto, so the, in the first screen, if I saw this correctly, you came out with, with two um, compounds that were effective. And then in the, the second screen, um, you had one co compound. Is this, so is this one compound in the second screen, one of the two from the first screen? <laughs> no, or is this, no. No, okay. no, unfortunately, no, unfortunately not because we have a three now, but the, the, the readout of experiments and also if, I, I, I don't know if it's well understandable, but uh, also the readout was different and the cell models used for the analysis was completely different. So, uh, but no, we don't have the, the same, so we have more options. Uh, 
but so you're following up with with all three of them trying to with the three yes yes ones. but uh, in the second part of our um, of our screen so in, at the MBL we started with less uh, with a smaller number of compounds so what we would like to do in the future and we wish that our collaboration with the EMBL could could uh, go on uh, in the future to test uh, the work uh, drug con collection of uh, uh, molecules and compounds that we have uh, started uh, in Berlin. So using microscopy with uh, this uh, kind of uh, readout. I can uh, uh, add a few uh, few words. I I would like to uh, to. Uh, stress that uh, right now we focus on uh, uh, two compounds uh, from the first screening, drug screening, um, because are also um, uh, compounds that are uh, in uh, clinical uh, use. Uh, but there are uh, other, uh, um, other uh, uh, promising compounds, uh, um, drugs or compounds that uh, can be, uh, can be um, further studied uh, and uh, uh, represent new uh, opportunities. Um, uh, also, for uh, um, in, within the non annotated uh, um, uh, compounds, so this will, will be a new um, a new object of um, research. Great, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, other questions? Um, yes, I would have one. Um, it's, it's a comment more and then a question. So I would like to um, thank Roberta here again, because I think she was our most resilient user of the year last year, because she walked into our office at the most impossible day when the lockdown hit in Germany and Italy at the same time and was stuck for two weeks. And Roberta, when I heard in summer that you were back at EMBL measuring, I couldn't believe it, the message. So thank you very much for your courage and believing into the project and believing into our services that you traveled despite the difficult situation twice or I think even three times to Heidelberg and before to Berlin. And um, I have a maybe a bit untypical question. So from your point of view as a user, because you were our first generation of using common services between EU Open Screen in Berlin and the Euro Imaging services at EMBL in Heidelberg, what would be your advice to us um, how to do this for other uh, researchers in the future? Could we do something different? Could we do something that we should continue that where you experience, okay, this was really beneficial having it in place? Any advice? Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your uh, <laughs> feedback from your side. And uh, for me also, um, I am now a PhD student. So I also have to say that uh, it could be, it as for me a very nice experience. And also uh, Corbel give me the possibility to improve my skills and my career, also my curriculum. So uh, for me, it's a good opportunity to grow uh, in the academic and also to improve my expertise with the help of uh, the scientists involved in the research, each research infrastructure, with the, their support that uh, did finish, didn't stop uh, after the experience because we are in touch with uh, Faba, with Martin uh, all the time. So Corbel uh, maybe could uh, improve the connection before, uh, for my, from my side, of course, uh, connection from uh, the European research infrastructure and give, and give uh, during the time a new uh, opportunity, you no know, funding of option for us to to visit again uh, your institute because it is important not not only to collaborate or to ask for a service uh, to for research of course but also to improve the expertise of people involved so Corbel could 
provide uh, additional fund for uh, more uh, experience or for new visit during the year or uh, uh, for a second chance of, as in in our case when the, when we finish with project we 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 want because we opened the uh, from the ob obtained results uh, we we can start uh, many projects together and so we have to continue in this field so i don't know if uh, professor uh, would you add something no just that it was a really a great uh, experience a great opportunity that uh, uh, gave us uh, the possibility to interact uh, in uh, with with scientists uh, and uh, expertise in a completely different field of ours so thank you <laughs> I, thank i think you. that I should continue the corbel project <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but also check out our website um the eurobanking website because there are funding opportunities in the field and in particular for Italy, we might have something in the drawer, but um, this is also something we could discuss bilaterally. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for I have Roberto? some comments. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks okay. to both of you too, for great presentations. And uh, uh, I just want to echo what, what Antti already said, that it's a good benchmark for this kind of uh, collaborative effort. Also, congratulations on, on managing the project under these conditions, which is an act achievement by itself, uh, by all people who were involved in this. Uh, when it comes to European research infrastructures, I think right now the emphasis is on this kind of uh, multidisciplinary projects where you have different infrastructures coming together. So I think your project clearly serves as a benchmark in that respect. Uh, I was uh, going to ask uh, some questions and these are questions that uh, I think uh, you may have received before. <laughs> and uh, first of all, when uh, designing the library, uh, what kind of considerations did you have in terms of uh, the compounds that you limited the library to, so that the, the pre-selection there? Um, then when it comes to intellectual property at the end of the project, because I gather there, are, there is potential interest to take this into uh, uh, tech transfer and innovations and uh, uh, all what that involves. Uh, how do you foresee to take care of this? And have you experienced any problems in this regard? Or do you foresee any problems when it comes to IPR? So library and IPR. IPR. Um, Roberta, do you want to answer or? I can answer. <laughs> okay, thank you for uh, this uh, question. This is a really important uh, um, issue uh, regarding the libraries uh, um, because we were uh, uh, we were um, uh, going uh, to explore the unknown. Uh, we will uh, try to um, to uh, to get uh, uh, a larger library as possible. Uh, including uh, non annotated uh, drugs, uh, but also um, uh, FDA approved uh, um, libraries, uh, uh, drug, uh, drug uh, libraries, uh, or uh, drugs in clinical use to make uh, um, our research uh, um, closer to uh, clinical application. That is our um, definition and our uh, and as a the kind of research that we we are doing here, translational research and equipment and discussion, uh, um, uh, of, of course, uh, um, finding something within uh, FDA uh, uh, drug appro approved drugs uh, or uh, drugs ready in clinical use that could uh, facilitate uh, the starting of a clinical uh, um, of a clinical trials in Italy. 
uh, regarding the API, of course, this kind of um, research will uh, certainly um, give us uh, the opportunity to find, uh, um, uh, to have uh, uh, findings uh, with uh, intellectual uh, um, properties uh, issues that are uh, or uh, um, uh, used in a different way, so drug repurposing, uh, so like uh, uh, patent of use, uh, or uh, um, eventually uh, the, uh, the identification of compounds uh, which uh, are not uh, um, well known uh, that can be developed in a full uh, drug development uh, um, program. Of course, this would uh, need for us other, um, other um, expertise in, uh, uh, in chemical uh, synthesis uh, or modification and uh, so will require further uh, collaboration um, and funds um, for which eventually we, uh, we, uh, we will plan to apply uh, for uh, either a new European grant uh, um, uh, or uh, uh, there is for example uh, from the European Research uh, Council uh, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the grant proof of concept for uh, that help uh, in the application uh, in the let's say um, uh, patent application uh, and uh, the development of, uh, of uh, a, the drugs that uh, is uh, of interest uh, or other fund or other uh, um, European grants uh, or also Italian uh, that um, uh, are also very also consistent uh, some uh, in fact are from the association uh, um, funds, uh, Italian association against uh, funds for research against funds. so um, yes okay thanks Thank you. Great. Um, there's a question in the chat um, from Chiara. Chiara, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to congratulate with the great talks. I was just curious to um, know about the affinities of the lead compound that you have uh, identified if, I don't know, there is any correlation between uh, the um, uh, most uh, powerful to the most effective. Uh, just a curiosity from uh, this point of view. Thanks. Roberta? Yes. Um, hi, Chiara. Thank you for your uh, question. Um, yes, we have uh, some compounds uh, that uh, we obtain. Uh, so uh, when we try different kind of experiments on these uh, compounds and we check, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the cell viability. After that, we validated in our lab with different kind of experiments to check uh, well their uh, selective act activity on the mutated MPM1 um, cell lines, but also on the other, on different cell lines expressing the mutating protein. At the same, uh, at the same time, uh, we are, uh, we perform the different kind of experiments, uh, in vitro experiment to, um, to characterize our lead compounds, uh, for example, uh, uh, for their uh, ability to um, induce some pathway inside the cells or apoptosis cell uh, cell apoptosis uh, so to try to well understand how these lead compounds uh, um, uh, act in the in our cell model uh, but uh, another interesting uh, um, things that maybe we have not uh, mentioned is that uh, um, together with our lead compa heat compound that we obtain now uh, we have also we obtain also a lot of information about uh, other targets that could be targetable for drug uh, uh, for drug discovery 
uh, and um, we have other uh, pathway involved. So, for example, uh, we uh, observe it that um, we have frequently uh, the same pathway involved. So, all compounds could be uh, tested, could be divided in the, into big classes of compounds that uh, we know that are known uh, players uh, in this uh, AML entity. So. Uh, we obtain a lot uh, of uh, data from the screening uh, um, and we are focusing on two compounds now because we are uh, going on with the experimental part uh, moving uh, in in vivo research and on uh, primary cells but of course we have also to manage uh, a lot of data obtained uh, with uh, the, the other compound, interesting compounds and similar uh, structure. Or also think about the structure of, of our uh, uh, potential drug uh, eats. So yes, we have to check. Uh, 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 we yeah. open uh, to, <laughs> we have a lot to do, of course, uh, but now I try just to summarize a little. No, what what uh, what can be added to answer uh, Chiara is that uh, the the drugs that we are we found are not uh, directed uh, um, to MPN one mutated ML, uh, MPN one mutated protein. Uh, they are acting uh, against other targets. They um, mm -hmm. no other right now or unknown but uh, it has to be, uh, be uh, studied. The, um, the uh, compound that uh, um, came out uh, from the high throughput microscopy based screening um, is um, an uh, unknown compound. It's, a, it's no compound but with no, uh, no um, available target. Uh, we don't know whether this compound is binding directly to MPM1 mutated uh, or proteins or uh, as other targets. So this is uh, only the start of um, the, the process, the, the story. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would have a very small question, if possible. Okay, just one, one, one last quick question then. Go ahead, please, David. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, it's um, more for Roberta, actually. Thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. I'm, um, I'm interested in understanding how you um, uh, run this, like uh, how it was the collaboration. Did you go actually to the EMBL and in Berlin in person and you did the experiment? Were you trained and you did the experiment by yourself? So did you also bring certain level of expertise than with yourself when you came back, or you just send, send the, um, the samples and then the experts there run the experiments for you? Okay. Hi, David. Thank you for your question. Maybe it's not uh, clear uh, uh, from my presentation, but maybe could be an opportunity for others to understand well the project. So yes, I I I did some uh, preliminary visit to each research infrastructure, and uh, so at EMBL and uh, at FMP in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of uh, the visits uh, pre were preceded by uh, setting up experiments conducted here in-house. Uh, of course, using suggestion from uh, uh, the expertise of, uh, from the scientists involved. So we had uh, together meetings before uh, the all phases, um, uh, conference call, uh, and also from the, the first part, for example, me and the professor uh, went the first uh, visit. Uh, we went together uh, uh, in uh, Berlin to set up all uh, the the phases with the, the the stage of our uh, to plan well or the experimental plan. And uh, after um, Corbel allowed me to um, visit. Uh, for a small period of time uh, before the screening, real screen. So uh, I visit uh, to 
to go to set up all the experiment, the condition. And after I went again to perform the screening with the uh, scientists involved. So, of course, uh, it gives me a lot of experience uh, and uh, expertise. Yes, yeah. now I am not uh, an expert, of course, I, but I learn a lot and I improve a lot. And uh, in some way, I try to reproduce, uh, to do uh, the same here but uh, in a small small scale of course we have no high throughput sm small uh, throughput but we try to have a sufficient uh, throughput to manage with a uh, uh, big number of uh, of drugs and also to it uh, also improve my un my knowledge try to be well uh, design uh, all the pipeline of the experiments from the beginning, from the screening uh, to the, the data analysis. So yes, uh, I, I think that it, uh, it was a very big experience for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, and that's a, actually a great transition because um, now for um, in the last few minutes of the session, We'll actually um, next hear uh, very quickly from uh, Bane Steckmann, who is the head of operations and scientific strategy at EO Open Screen, who will tell us a bit exactly how user access generally works at EO Open Screen and what their service offer looks like. Uh, thank you, Johanna. Thank you for the introduction and uh, the invitation to present today in the Eurobiomaging virtual pub. I think it's a really great format. And after these two excellent talks, I will just use the next five to 10 minutes to not only explain you what the open screen is doing, but also in a little bit broader perspective, um, explain you a little bit more about the advantages of using chemical probes in, um, in cell biology. So eOpen Screen is the European Research Infrastructure for Chemical Biology and Early Drug Discovery. And as an infrastructure, we provide access to technologies, for example, um, compound screening platforms, um, but also access to resources like compound collections with different compound collections, um, general purpose um, diversity libraries with um, 100,000 commercial compounds, but also smaller known by actives and repurposing libraries or in collaboration with the uh, structural biology research infrastructures in Stockton and INEX, we also offer access to fragment libraries. Um, and furthermore, yes, um, access to expertise, for example, in assay development, um, high throughput screening and medicinal chemistry for the hit to lead optimization, um, but also access to fair data sets and, and training. And we work together with users from both academia as well as industry. And just a few slides on a more general context. Um, I think I thought this might be interesting here um, for the audience um, to just briefly uh, summarize or give you an overview of the different advantages of using chemical probes in um, cell biology, also in combination or in addition um, to other cell biology methods like um, mutagenesis mutagen uh, or RNAi or CRISPR-Cas9. Um, if you work with a protein and you study a protein, then one adv advantage already is that chemical probes exert the effect at the protein level. So it's a more direct perturbation of your cellular system. Depending on the protein that you study um, or the chemical probes that you choose, you can address intra as well as extracellular targets on living intact cells. An important advantage is that you have a high degree of control over your system. Um, you can apply your chemical probes uh, in different concentrations. You can dose them very easily. Um, and because they, most of them exert the effect very rapidly within minutes, you can define the time of the onset. And again, most of these uh, probes are also reversible. You can wash them out and then you can return um, to the control conditions. So basically, if you work with cells under the microscope, you can look at them under control conditions and then you apply increasing concentrations of your, um, of your probes. And then at the end, you wash out uh, the probes and you return to the control situation. And all this 
um, on the identical genetic background, but actually on these same exact the same cells. And in many, uh, depending on the experiments or the, the questions that you ask, but in many situations, um, probes can be very useful, especially in combination or in addition to, to other methods. For example, if we think of multifunctional proteins, if you, um, of course you can with mutagenesis, you can um, insert point mutations and targeting the individual active sites of the proteins. Um, but sometimes it's much easier to, to also use an inhibitor that binds to one of these active sites, and then you can directly in, um, inhibit individual functions of the proteins, which allows us to, to refine your um, interpretations of the phenotype. Or if you think of protein complexes, uh, in many cases, if you remove um, an individual subunit of a protein complex it becomes instable or if you interfere with the assembly of the protein complexes they became completely instable and then it's very difficult to to um, assign a certain phenotype to individual functions or complexes uh, or subunits of the protein whereas if you use chemical probes you leave the steady state levels of the individual subunits um, unchanged um, the protein complex can form, but still then you can apply these inhibitors or the probes and study um, the function and the role of the protein complexes. Or another example are, um, is the protein families. And depending on your, on your research questions and the probe that you select, you can choose probes which are very selective towards individual members of a protein family. Whereas in another situation, you may prefer to choose probes which have a more pan family effect. Um, and if you combine these, um, probes with other methods, as I said, um, point mutations or, or an AI or CRISPR-Cas9, um, it gives you more confidence in your data and also the interpretation of your data. Interestingly, um, what we also observe is if you introduce a novel chemical probe for a certain protein target, um, these can be usually published in high impact journals because many other researchers will use these probes and always cite uh, your, your publication. So it's, it's also um, a quite rewarding type of um, research. And also what we see is if you introduce a novel probe, this triggers the research on this particular target by other researchers. And importantly, at the end, if you work with therapeutic targets, um, Developing chemical probes with a defined mode of action can help you to validate this bio biological target as a druggable um, therapeutic target. And chemical probes have been instrumental in advancing our understanding in many cell biology areas over the last decades. Um, and so I listed here a few of those, um, which I think are more frequently used and more famous. And I just outlined here some example, which you may know, for example, Monistro, which is um, um, quite well-known inhibitor of um, kinesine 5, which is a um, spindle disruptor, and this was very instrumental in advancing our understanding in the mitotic spindle um, formation. Or most of you also know colchicine, which is a microtubule disruptor, which helped us to study, for example, the, the uh, cytoskeleton. And this example also shows you that, that many of these probes um, are natural products um, that have been um, extracted, for example, from plants. And the second thing you may know, uh, notice is that these compounds are pretty small. They have 300 to 500 Dalton in, in many cases, some natural products slightly more. But if you compare the size to peptides or RNA molecules or proteins or antibodies, uh, which can have up to 100,000 Daltons, you realize how small these compounds are. So these are now a two-dimensional depiction of the um, small molecules, but in fact, they are, have rotatable bonds. So they are three-dimensional and they are usually also flexible. An important point that I would like also to make here on this slide is uh, on the left in the bottom, I listed three um, online resources. Um, so if you would like to, um, to, to work with a chemical probe or an inhibitor for your, for your protein, um, invest time to better understand um, the properties and also the limitations of this inhibitors. In many cases, we also see the literature is full of the use of anti um, um, inhibitors or also the catalogs. They always tell you there's a specific inhibitor for all kinds of, of proteins. You have to invest a lot of time up front to better understand what are the side effects, the off-target effects um, of this um, compound. 
um, and don't choose those who are um, used in the literature most often. Uh, and in some or in many cases, you have, um, like, let's say, a second generation of these compounds, or you have to choose um, different compounds to really be sure that the the phenotype that you observe can be related to a certain uh, protein. So that that's my, if this is the punchline of my talk today, this is my take home message. If you choose a new probe, really invest time and, and try to understand the limitations and the properties of these um, probes. But in many cases, you don't find um, a chemical probe for a certain protein because the discovery and the development of these chemical probes is quite um, a long project, resource intense. Um, it's a long project and it requires the collaboration between chemists, biologists, um, the, the, the staff at the screening platforms, as well as the IT experts. First of all, you need the compound collections. So nowadays you can buy them off the shelves from the vendors, but ultimately after the screening, you still need a collaboration partner uh, in the chemistry department to help you to optimize um, the compounds that you identify in, in the screening process. Um, and you also ideally, if you can work with screening platforms together with which give you a higher degree of automation and miniaturization, which allows you then also to screen a larger number of compounds because at the end of the day you need to screen diversity um, so if you can screen tens of thousands or hundred thousand compounds that's always better than just screening a thousand or two thousand compounds because at the end you will have active hit compounds that you need to develop further in a hit to lead optimization process and it, it's really important to to start this part of your experiments with a good starting material um, and if you screen tens or hundred thousand of compounds, you generate a lot of data. So you also need um, specialists who can or who are able to to crunch the data and, and model it and, and analyze it. And because of this um, complexity of these type of research, and you have to bring um, the different expertise together, that's not all everywhere the case. Also in Europe. So therefore, we we had the idea to to. Um, initiate eOpen Screen as an open access research infrastructure in, in Europe. And we're currently supported by eight countries and we were established as, a, as an ERIC like Europe Imaging in mid 2018. And our headquarters is here in, in Berlin, in Germany. And this is an overview of our member countries and also the, uh, the partner sites or, or our local nodes to, to be in the uh, Europe Imaging jargon. And you can see we have most of our um, nodes of partner sites are screening platforms, uh, including the one here in the map in, in Hamburg, um, uh, sorry, in Berlin, the FMP, um, which was also um, the place where Roberta and uh, Professor Matelli uh, conducted uh, the research at this FMP screening unit just above me, which is led by Jens von Kries and with the help of Martin Carola and Sabrina. And the operational model, just very briefly, is similar to your bioimaging work with external scientists. And then the ERIC, the open screen as such, manages the access um, for the external scientists, uh, the biologists, and bring them together onto our um, associated screening platforms or chemistry groups. So the model is very similar to, to your bioimaging. And in addition to biologists, we also work with chemists and database users, but in the interest of time, I would just focus on the benefits that, um, that we provide for biologists who would like to screen with us. So important is that the biologist, the external scientist needs to have uh, an essay which we can use for screening, either in a 24 or 96 well-played format. Um, so this essay will then be transferred onto one of our uh, screening platforms. Um, this involves optimization and miniaturization of the essay um, and then the screening. Um, because we have a distributed network of screening platforms, we can offer a variety of different readout um, and technologies. And afterwards for the validation, when we, when we just want to test a smaller number of compounds, we also have more specialized um, readout technologies. 
We have different compound libraries, as I mentioned, for repurposing natural products, um, fragment libraries, or our workhorse is the general purpose diversity library. We can screen them different essay, um, essay formats. In most cases, we try to screen in 384 well played and under different biosafety levels. And as I mentioned, after the screening, uh, we also have chemistry groups that support the user in the hit to lead optimization process. And that's very schematic, like a two-phase model of the of the project. First is the screening part, um, where we come up with a list of um, hit compounds. We categorize them in different hit series. And afterwards, um, together with the chemistry side, it's kind of an iterative cycle of optimization uh, as part of the hit to lead optimization. And at the end of this process, hopefully, you have a very potent and selective chemical probe that you can use um, um, to answer your uh, research questions. And my last slide is uh, just to note that we will we make our primary screening data available in our database. We are committed to verification of data, but we offer an optional, optional, optional sorry, <laughs> embargo period of up to, to three years so that you have time to prepare your publication or to file um, a patent. With this, I'd like to, to close and thank you all for, for your attention and the kind invitation to present here today. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Bernard. I hope um, some people get some um, inspiration for potential collaborations with EO Open Screen going forward. And I think in the interest of time, if anybody has any questions, uh, maybe they can contact Bernard directly um, via his email. And I'm just going to then to wrap up this uh, pub meeting, hand over to Antje, who is the interim director of the Biohub of Eurobioimaging, um, who will briefly talk about um, Eurobioimaging user access and how Eurobioimaging supports cross RI projects. Thanks a lot, Johanna, and thanks a lot, Barne. And maybe at this point, where we are transitioning from EU Open Screen to Eurobioimaging, I also want to mention the people behind Corbel, because we have Sonia here on board today in the audience. Um, who was involved together with Frau Leitner in managing all the users that um, took advantage of the common service pipelines, which was really a new thing at that time. And we are still continuing to provide those services together as best as we can. And as I said, um, please also look out for the Eurobiomaging website where we are listing funding opportunities, which might enable you, but also maybe your colleagues and peers to access the Eurobiomaging notes and also to help reach out to EU Open Screen. In the interest of time, I will keep this presentation very short. Most of you are also very familiar with Eurobioimaging. So it's mainly meant for the new guests here on board today. And with this, I share my screen. And you should see now the slide about Eurobioimaging. So um, Eurobioimaging, similar to EU Open Screen, is owned by the European countries. So we have 15 countries at the moment that are Eurobioimaging ERIC members and the EMBL. And in those um, ERIC members, we have 25 nodes, which are representing right now 112 individual imaging facilities, which are all openly accessible and available for any researcher who needs imaging infrastructure support and access to at the moment, 45 different technologies. So we have a huge portfolio of different cutting edge imaging technologies. And again, I would like to invite you to visit our website if you're interested to learn more about these. We are offering in Eurobioimaging access to the technologies, but as also Roberta has pointed out, it's not only the access to the instrument that is really beneficial, but it's also talking to the people on site, talking to the experts who are running these instruments for many years and who can provide you a lot of insight knowledge and you can gain more skills. In addition, Eurobiomaging is offering uh, support with the image data analysis and management. And um, we're also offering access to image data repositories and analysis tools. And we are offering training opportunities for everyone, meaning for users as well as for staff. I think I can't really add a lot to what Roberta already explained before, what are the benefits, because she gave an excellent um, example on this one. I think the take home message is really that um, when you come to Europe Imaging, you not only can try new instruments on new techniques that you cannot access at home, but you also get high quality image data, which um, is owned by the user in the first place when they come to Europe Imaging, and um, you learn a lot and um, you can really test also technologies 
before you might invest into them yourself at, in, at the home institution. And that's already my last slide uh, for today. So if you are interested and want to learn more about the opportunities in Europe Imaging, please visit the EuroImaging.eu website. Here we have the so-called web portal, which gives an overview of the many different imaging facilities in the different Europe Imaging countries and their technology offer and additional services that they are offering, as well as all the other exciting opportunities in Europe Imaging. And as mentioned before, we have one dedicated website on funding opportunities as well. So thanks a lot. And with this, I already start stop sharing the screen and uh, would like to wish you a nice weekend from my side. Thank you, um, Antje, for this uh, brief overview. And I just want to wrap up with um, quickly showing what's on the outlook for the next virtual pub meeting and uh, warmly inviting you also to our meeting next week, where we'll be looking at data management from a biological and preclinical imaging perspective. And with that, um, again, a big thank you to uh, Roberta, Professor Martelli, to Bane and Antje for presenting. I think this is a very interesting and wide ranging uh, presentations and discussions today and I wish everyone a nice afternoon and a nice weekend.